Listen, we're either a pathetic bunch of people here this morning to be pitied by everybody else for our naivety in believing in a resurrection, or we have got hold of the most important thing in human history. Because if Christ is not raised, we have no gospel, we're still in our sins, we're to be pitied, says Paul. a risen saviour this morning. Let's turn uh, to another song that you'll know well, number 26 in your handbooks, In Christ Alone. My hope is found, a living hope, because of what we celebrate this morning. He is my light, my strength, my song. Let's sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, Babe, the gift of love and 
Righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Delay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse. morning. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. We are present this morning at the possible site of the tomb of Jesus Christ. Nobody knows for exact certainty simply because at the time, the tomb itself was not significant. It was the person of Jesus Christ himself who was significant. But actually, there should not have been a tomb at all for Jesus. Because he died, you remember, as a Roman criminal. And as a Roman criminal, his body had become the possession of the Roman authority. And in Jerusalem, the bodies of criminals who had been crucified, and there were many crucifixions during the Roman era, the bodies were normally thrown into a deep, narrow gorge on the south side of the old city, known as the Valley of Gehenna, or sometimes in Scripture known as the Valley of Hinnon. And that really was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. It's where all the garbage was thrown and there was a fire continually burning down in the bottom of that valley the bodies of dead animals were thrown there and so were the bodies of criminals to be incinerated and that is where the bodies of the two thieves crucified 
either side of Jesus would have been thrown. On Thursday morning this week, I walked through the Valley of Gehenna. And uh, I was first there about 40 years ago, and then it was still a dirty garbage area. Now it's been cleaned up quite a bit, but right at the bottom, there's still a lot of garbage. There's still evidence of fires that have burned in order to destroy the garbage that's been dumped there. But Jesus' body, though normally as a Roman criminal, should have been thrown there, was not. Let me explain why. The decision to crucify Jesus was made by Pontius Pilate on the early morning of what we know as Good Friday. In the very early hours of that morning, the Sanhedrin Council had met. It was the highest Jewish authority, 71 members plus the presiding chief priest, so 72 in all. They didn't have the authority to sentence anybody to death. But they decided they would recommend to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, that this man, Jesus, for a variety of reasons that you can read about in Scripture that they had presented were sufficient for him to warrant being crucified. They brought him before Pontius Pilate, you remember, and he interrogated Jesus and realized there really was no case and that he should go free. But it just so happened that Herod, who was territory was Galilee at that stage, was in Jerusalem, and as Jesus was a Galilean, Pontius Pilate thought, I'll get this off my hands and I'll send him to Herod, and Herod can interview him. He was sent across the city to Herod. Herod tried to get him to perform some miracles, to be entertained by him, and eventually sent him back to Pontius Pilate, who, knowing there was no case against Jesus, decided there was a good way of releasing him. As it was the Passover, he would offer one of the prisoners due to die to be set free. And he decided to let the crowd choose who would be set free. And he selected two. He selected the worst of the prisoners, a man called Barabbas, who was a robber and a thief. And he selected the best, a man called Jesus. And in Pontius Pilate's reasoning, he thought, if I give them the choice of one of these two, to be set free, they're going to choose Jesus. Everybody knew Barabbas. He was a thief. He was a robber. When Barabbas was in town, everybody locked their doors, kept their kids at home, kept their women folks off the street. This man was dangerous. And Pontius Pilate said, you can have this man back on the street this morning if you want him. Or you can have this man, Jesus, and people in Jerusalem knew Jesus. Nobody had to lock their doors when Jesus was around. They didn't keep their kids at home. They loved him. They climbed all over him. There was nothing to be afraid for their women folks when Jesus was around. Which do you want? And to Pilate's amazement, they began to say, release to us Barabbas. And if you read the story carefully, Pilate then began to argue in favor of Jesus, in defense of Jesus, and said, why? What has this man done? And they began to chant all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. And so Pilate washed his hands, which meant, I'm not responsible for this. But he allowed the crowd to have their way, handed Jesus over to the soldiers who beat him, flogged him, and then made him carry his own cross up to the place called Golgotha. And by nine o'clock that morning, he was already on the cross. Things have moved very fast from the early hours until nine o'clock. Now, the disciples had been wrong-footed by all of this. They were not expecting Jesus to be arrested and to be crucified. And so they were not thinking in terms of him dying, and so they had no time to think about a burial. They had no time to plan his funeral. But there were two men on the Sanhedrin Council who voted against the crucifixion of Jesus. The vote was 69-4, two against of the 71. The two who voted against were a man called Joseph of Arimathea, and it says in Luke 23 in verse 50, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, that is the Sanhedrin Council, a good and an upright man who had not consented 
to the decision to crucify Jesus. So that's the first vote against, Joseph Arimathea. The other vote came from a man called Nicodemus. Nicodemus had come to see Jesus one night earlier on, and you remember that story, and he was introduced in John chapter 3, verse 1, as a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. These two men voted against the crucifixion of Jesus, and these two men knew what was going to come. And it was these two men who planned a burial for Jesus. Because it was the responsibility of the Roman governor to decide what to do with the bodies of criminals, and normally they were just thrown, as I said, into the Valley of Gehenna. It tells us in John's Gospel, chapter 19 and verse 38, that behind the scenes, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. That was Pilate's prerogative. With Pilate's permission, it goes on to say, he came and took the body away. That was after 3 p.m. when Jesus had died. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds weight. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Possibly this garden, possibly this tomb down behind me. And because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. We can't be sure of exactly the tomb, but it was very close to the place of crucifixion. And if Golgotha, the place of the skull, is the site that has been identified and you've been introduced to it or will be if you've not yet gone on the tour around this garden, then it's a matter of only a couple of hundred meters away from the place of the tomb. And the reason I'm telling you this is because it was not just a fluke of history that Jesus had two friends on the Sanhedrin Council. Joseph Arimathea, by the way, was a secret disciple. Nobody knew he really was a friend of Jesus. Nicodemus had come by night, so nobody would know. So these two men were probably secret disciples, both of them. But it's interesting that the Old Testament scriptures in the book of Isaiah had prophesied very specifically what would happen with the body of Jesus. Because in Isaiah 53 and verse 9, it says he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but was with the rich in his death. Now, one alternative translation is this. His grave was appointed with the wicked, but with the rich man was his tomb. When it says his grave was appointed with the wicked, he died as a criminal under Roman law, destined for the grave of the wicked, which would be that his body would have been incinerated that night in the Valley of Gehenna. But, said Isaiah, with the rich man was his tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea was the rich man who happened to be at the right time, in the right place, with the right connections, who asked permission. He clearly had access to Pontius Pilate, a man of influence, and was able to take the body of Jesus and bury it in his own tomb. Exactly as written by Isaiah in the 8th century before Christ, with pinpoint accuracy. I've said on several occasions that we have a better reason for believing the facts about Jesus 
than that the Bible tells us that they happened. And the better reason is that the Bible tells us they would happen long before they ever did happen. That's impressive. If you pick up today's newspaper and read yesterday's news, we're not surprised by that. We expect to do that. If you pick up today's newspaper and read next week's news, and next week it happens exactly as you read it this week, you would probably want to meet the editor. <laughs> if it was next month, next year, next century, we'd have reason to stop and scratch our heads and say, how in the world, with such accuracy, was this statement made so long in advance? Only four people attended the funeral of Jesus, Joseph and Nicodemus. And then it tells us in Mark chapter 15 that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, stood and watched Joseph and Nicodemus as they laid his body in the tomb. None of the 12 disciples attended. One had already committed suicide that same day, Judas Iscariot. The other 11 had fled for their lives, were hiding behind locked doors, we're told, presumably completely disregarding the body of Jesus, assuming that probably he had been thrown into the fire of Gehenna. The next day was the Sabbath, and so everybody lay low on the Sabbath. The women who wanted to embalm the body of Jesus were not able to come to the tomb that day. But on the third day, two women came with spices and perfume, as we began to read there in Luke 24. And when they came to the tomb, the stone that had been rolled across the front of it had been rolled away. They went inside, the body was gone, and suddenly two men stood there and they asked a question that we need to ask ourselves as well. Why do you look for the living among the dead? In other words, don't only think about who Jesus was, Think about who Jesus is, present tense. You're looking among the dead for a past tense Jesus, but he's not past tense. He's alive, was the message they gave to him. You know, when we go to a grave of a loved one, perhaps it's usually to think about who they were. When we go up the Mount of Olives, you'll see that uh, the whole of the side of the Mount of Olives is full of tombs. And Hillary and I were up there a couple of days ago, and we saw a whole van load of uh, people come and find their way down amongst the tombs to the tomb of somebody who was clearly a loved one or a family member, or for some reason they wanted to be there and stood around the tomb. They began to read together from the scriptures they brought with them. And without doubt, what they were doing was remembering who this deceased person was, past tense, remembering what they had done, past tense, remembering what that meant to them, past tense. These women came to the tomb to do that very thing. And the two men standing there said to them, you're looking in the wrong place if you're looking for somebody in the past tense. He is not here. He is risen. This is not a memorial to a martyr. This is evidence, this empty tomb, that this Jesus is alive again. And this, of course, becomes absolutely crucial to the Christian faith and to the Christian message. We're not remembering a Jesus who was, who did marvelous things, who said marvelous things. Christianity only makes sense in the light of the fact that the Jesus who was is the Jesus who is today, right now, alive, 
and with whom we can know and interact, with whom we can engage. And there are three things I'll just leave you with regarding the resurrection of Christ and why it is so central and vital to the Christian faith and to the Christian life. First of all, because the resurrection of Christ gives proof of who Christ is. That is what Paul said in Athens in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. He says, for God has set a day when he would judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Now it says, Paul, this is the ultimate proof that this is the authentic Messiah. God has given that proof by raising him from the dead. And everything about Christ that is important to us is proven by his resurrection from the dead. It is proof of his uniqueness. I have been to many tombs of famous people. Been to the tomb of Mao Zedong in Beijing, in Tiananmen Square. I've been at the tombs of the pharaohs of Egypt. I've been to the grave of John F. Kennedy in Arlington Cemetery in Washington. All these tombs have one thing in common, of course, that this is where the remains of that particular person lie. In the case of Mao Zedong, he's actually on display. He looks plastic, but Supposedly, that's him. You can walk by and look at him. It's a great fiddle because on the way in, people are selling plastic flowers and people buy them and they go in, they throw them and there's people collecting them and taking them out the back and coming back and selling them again. It's a great little business for somebody. This tomb is unique. It is empty. And God, in raising Jesus Christ from the dead, amongst other things, vindicates him as the one sent by God and the one to whom the whole of creation, says Paul, the whole of humankind is ultimately accountable. That's his point there. And if we need proof of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, we need to look at the empty tomb and realize that he is not here. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. We are to be pitted more than all men. Listen, we're either a pathetic bunch of people here this morning to be pitted by everybody else for our naivety in believing in a resurrection or we have got hold are the most important thing in human history. Because if Christ is not raised, we have no gospel, we're still in our sins, we're to be pitted, says Paul. Second thing, if the resurrection of Christ gives proof, second thing is that the resurrection of Christ gives power. This is not just a historical event, we stand back and say, wow, that's fantastic. Wow, I'm really impressed with the fact that God raised him from the dead. But this becomes something that is personal and subjective in our own lives and experience. So Paul writes in Philippians 3 verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. What is the power of his resurrection? It is the transformation of our lives by being brought into a relationship with the living Jesus Christ. That's why many of you are here this morning, because you have known that in your own experience. It is very likely some of us have not known that and don't know that. But the majority of us on this tour are here because you share that common experience with others, that you've come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, where the living Christ has indwelt your heart and your soul and transformed you. I was reading just the other day, about 100 years ago, there was an American atheist who was very well known. His name was Robert Ingersoll. And he traveled around giving lectures discrediting Christianity. 
And once he was in London, in England, and he stood up before a large audience and said, there is no God. And if there is a God, may he strike me dead. In the next five minutes, he took out his big pocket watch and he counted down the five minutes. And according to the article I read, it said men sweated, ladies fainted. They were expecting a lightning bolt to incinerate him. And at the end of five minutes, nothing happened. He said, there you are. There is no God. And he scoffed at the Bible and scoffed at God. There's a well-known preacher in London at that time called Joseph Parker. And uh, somebody told him about Ingersoll's five-minute challenge of God. And Parker said, so this gentleman from America thinks he can exhaust God's patience in only five minutes. And when Ingersoll was told about that, he invited Joseph Parker to come for a public debate about the claims of Christianity. And Parker accepted the debate on certain conditions. He said to Ingersoll, I will bring 10 men from my church who have been delivered from alcoholism by Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you to bring only one man who's been delivered from alcoholism by atheism. I'm also going to bring 10 couples whose marriages have been saved and renewed by Jesus Christ. I'm challenging you to bring one couple only who can tell you that atheism has saved their marriage. And Ingersoll declined the challenge. He hadn't got anybody who was willing to testify. You see, you can debate all kinds of things that you cannot prove scientifically, but you cannot refute a changed life. And Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. You see, when Jesus Christ was raised again from the dead, Paul tells us he defeated the last enemy which was to be destroyed, which was death. And if Jesus Christ in being raised again from the dead, defeated the last enemy. It means he defeated every other enemy in the process. So if you and I are being defeated by an enemy, we're being defeated by an enemy which itself has already been defeated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to know Christ, says Paul. Not about him, I want to know him. Someone who's alive, someone who's real. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the transformation that he can bring about by indwelling a man, a woman, a boy, a girl by his Holy Spirit. And the third thing, resurrection gives proof. The resurrection gives power. The resurrection gives promise because in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17, Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. That means those who have died are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitted more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, the resurrection of Christ, says Paul, is the prototype the first fruit, the promise of a resurrection that God is going to give to all those who are in Christ. If Christ has not been raised, says Paul, there is no resurrection. But if Christ has been raised, then our resurrection is guaranteed. And it's at this point, Paul goes on to say, death has been swallowed up in victory where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? 
and Paul can afford to stand on the sideline and mock death. Where is your sting? Where is your victory? Yes, of course, we go through physical death. I'm quite glad about that. I don't want this body forever. <laughs> it's falling apart already. <laughs> but this body is not the sum total of you or of me. <laughs> Our bodies are not who we are. And this body will die and be buried. But because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, there will be a resurrection of the body, but also to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, to live eternally in his presence. And that is the glorious promise of the gospel. The empty tomb of Jesus is a foreshadowing of our own empty graves. And so the question those two men asked the women at the tomb, why do you look for the living among the dead? The grave is not the focus anymore. He's alive. He's alive. There are many monuments to dead people. But to Jesus, for Jesus, we're not interested in that. We're glad to come to a place like this. We're glad to speculate what it was like 2,000 years ago if this was the spot for those who made this incredible discovery that the tomb is empty because he's alive. Mary Magdalene meeting him, maybe in this very garden, thought he was the gardener, not expecting him. And when he looked her in the eye and said her name, she recognized him. But the issue was not the place. As we heard earlier, that's why people weren't looking for the place of Jesus' resurrection for more than 300 years. And then Constantine's mother came here and began to look for where the possible site might be. And I can imagine the Christians say, why are you interested in that? Well, just out of curiosity. And now, of course, people build shrines over such places. But the issue is not the place. The issue is the person. And our prayer for this tour is that as we take in all these wonderful sights and we see these places, these names with which we are so familiar from our reading of the scripture, that above and beyond all of that, we will have a fresh meeting with the living Christ. We'll hear again his words, come to me. Abide in me. Learn to be loved by me. And we go back from this place enriched. Not because we've been in places, but we've met again with the person of the living Jesus Christ. And that's why this is such a wonderful place to start this tour. If we're following chronologically the life of Jesus or chronologically following scripture, we should have ended up here. But we've started here. Because we begin, not with a Christ who was, but a Christ who is. Don't look for the living among the dead, because he's not among the dead. He's alive. And if you don't know him, or you've neglected to develop that relationship with him, let this week be a time of renewed rediscovery and a fresh relationship with the living Jesus Christ. We're going to share in the communion in just a few moments, but we're going to pray together. We're going to have a song before that. We're going to pray together. And let's ask that Christ will make himself 
fresh and real to us again during these days together. Father, we are so grateful that we can be at this beautiful place within the immediate vicinity of where the Lord Jesus Christ was made sin for us that he might carry our sin in judgment and satisfy the justice of God that in exchange we might be forgiven and freed and then having been buried he was raised again from the dead and is alive today and we pray that our relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ will be deeper and richer and more experiential and fuller and more central in our lives as a result of this time together. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. To watch this message again, go to our website, livingtruth.ca. You can also order DVDs and CDs, download transcripts, sign up for our monthly newsletter, check out the Living Truth Daily Devotional, sign up for podcasts, and read faith stories from other viewers. We love to hear from you, so send us your comments and testimonies. Living Truth is supported by viewers like you. Thank you for transforming lives through your financial participation. Join Charles Price next week for the beginning of a new series, Joshua, Finding Your Inheritance. I'm in the desert in a Bedouin tent in a seemingly bleak and lifeless landscape. And I'm reminded of a special Dutch friend of mine. And some of the stories he's told me. I've known Johan for almost 30 years and I've always been fascinated when he recalled his years in the Sinai Desert, living amongst the Bedouin. He left home and he set off on the popular hippie trail through the desert, from India to Israel, embarked on by many young people in the 1960s who were looking for the meaning of life. The nomadic lifestyle of the Bedouin appealed to Johan. So he settled down to live amongst them for a while. How did you survive, I asked him. What did you eat? Where did you find water? There seems to be nothing here in the desert. That's where you're wrong, he told me. And then he illustrated his point with a very funny little story. I've never forgotten, and it's always encouraged me when I felt like giving up. I used to live in a little tent, Johan recalled, and every morning I'd walk about 20 paces from the tent and relieve myself in the same place in the sand. I realised this gives streams in the desert a whole new meaning. After <coughs> two years, Johan explained with a glint in his eye, a plant grew. I laughed and I couldn't resist asking him, was it a sweet pea? Why do I tell you this story? Because it's fun, but also it contains an amazing spiritual truth. Just because you can't see something happening in someone's life or in an area you've gone to live in, it doesn't mean there's nothing happening. Seeds may well have been sown, and you may know nothing about what's going on. But if you just keep watering, Johan would say, one day a plant will bloom. Not only is there water to be found in the desert, some of the plants that do manage to grow there have put down 30-foot roots to draw on but there's also water to be shared. As Johan told me, the Bedouin have a saying, there's only one thing worse than murder in the desert. It's if you know where the water is and you don't tell someone who is passing. Apparently, two days in the summer without water in the desert and you're dead. When you've drunk the living water, the Lord Jesus himself, you're not to keep him to yourself, you're to share him. As Jesus told the woman he met at a well in Samaria, whoever drinks the water I give him will never <clears throat> thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 4:14. The world has many things to offer thirsty people, 
but they never satisfy. As Jesus said, anyone who drinks this water, the literal material, they'll be thirsty again. If you know where the water is, and you don't tell the person who's thirsty, who's passing by the Bedouins say, you're as good as giving them the death sentence. The Bedouin are known to be some of the most hospitable people in the world, and we've experienced that this evening. They share all of what they have. It's wonderful to be amongst them and have been offered tea. The Bedouin always leave people things on their way through the desert, through life. They lead food and matches and wood in trees so that people can find them and they can cook. They do this for practical reasons, knowing how impossible it is to survive in the desert without supplies. But they also share for sole reasons, thank you, <laughs> to say to other people, you are not alone in the world. He who has the sun has life. He who does not have the sun does not have life. If you have received Jesus, you have life to offer to the person who does not, who you meet along the way to offer him living water for sustenance, to welcome him into your tent for shelter. A king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Isaiah 32 verse two. Does that describe you? Philip is a keen amateur photographer. These pictures of his recent journey to Israel bring back the intense emotions he felt there. Well, you are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee on a boat and you almost feel how the disciples would have felt when Jesus came that same water and we were there. Uh, it's an it's unbelievable feeling. Philip's spiritual journey began when he was just a teen. It was during a time of struggle and poverty in war-torn Sri Lanka. And I was in the middle of it, and I was 14 years old. My car was torched while I was inside the car. How I escaped that, I still have no idea. Philip's life was spared. He was raised in a Christian home, so he dutifully thanked God for his protection. I used to say, God, thank you for giving me a place to sleep and thank you for giving me food. Bless everyone, amen. And that was all my relationship. In 2000, Philip moved to Canada in search of hope and a better life. He made a quick climb up the corporate ladder, but he knew something was missing. And that's when I realized that, uh, wow, I need to be saved because until such time, I never thought you can have a relationship with Jesus. Like you can bring him to, bring him to your day-to-day -day life. Philip made the decision to make Jesus his personal savior, and he believed the difficulties in his life were over. I have starved when I was a kid. I mean, I've seen riots, lost life, bomb blasts, and all those things. But I thought eventually now, it's everything is settled. I'm having a relationship with God. So I thought, end of story. But for Philip, it was just the beginning. And before he knew it, everything he held dear was lost including my job, my health. And I thought, okay, this is bad. I just became a Christian, so shouldn't I be blessed and I should have all these things and, and, uh, and I should be fine, so why is this happening to me? You know, in my language, there is a saying, what is worse than death is being forgotten. God am silent and silence it was killing me. He found hope for his weary soul when Living Truth decided to host a tour to the Holy Land. It didn't even take two minutes for me to decide. I said, brilliant, I'm going. Photography is my passion. Israel is a historical place. I thought that'll be a cool place to go. And I can take tons of pictures there. Fascinated by the history of the Holy Land, Philip busied himself with being a good tourist. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock. I was not the guy who was turning the Bible and listening to Charles Price or nodding my head, that's a good point. No, I was the guy who was with the camera trying to you know, shoot and I said, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, let's see what else. And I was so interested in taking people's expressions. When the Holy Land tour reached its stop at the River Jordan, 
Hillary Price began to preach a message on John the Baptist. For the first time on the tour, Philip put down his camera and paused to listen. And between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, there is 400 years of silence where humans and God are no longer on speaking terms with each other. So she said, are you waiting for something in your life? Do you think God has abandoned you? So that's the time I stopped my account. I said, yeah, of course, yes. Do you think God is silent? God is not doing anything to you? And you might be in a place in your life at the moment where you're standing in the middle of God's preparation for something and you don't know it. Just wait. That point went like zoom into my heart. Hillary went on to describe God as the conductor of an orchestra who, even in the silence between notes, still has command of the beat. So then Hillary said, in your life, you may not hear anything. There is no music. There's nothing happening. You must be thinking God is forgotten, but God is still doing this. And I thought, wow, God, thank you. Philip had finally found the assurance that God had been listening all along. A lot of things happened to me in my life. My life, remember I told you it was dry like the desert? He changed, he made it into an oasis. But the point that I'm trying to make is, even if he has not blessed me the way he has blessed me now, right after my trip, even if he has taken another 10 years, I'm still fine because I know God is still doing this. So that's... That's where I am now. My response to that wonderful message this morning is just in one word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Jesus who was is the Jesus who is. And in preparation for this very special celebration of communion, we're going to sing just three verses, the traditional tune, When I Survey. The wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain, I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. We'll remain seated as we sing.
Amen.